Um, like we did on the phone, what I'd like to do is to kind of get a start with how you came into this, how you came into the work, where right. it is that your kind of learning and passion intersected and, and drove you to the kind of research and work that you've done, and then we'll talk about that and go into from there into more specific questions. Well, I started off my work, my dissertation work, it was teaching children who didn't talk to talk. It was the first speech shaping and some autistic, some pe children with other disabilities. And, you know, it was it was kind of quite startling and amazing that you could actually do that. And so my dissertation work in 1960s, early 60s was was that, uh, you know, since that's that's pursued along in terms of uh, uh, different kinds of work of people working with autistic children and so on, teaching them language or. And then I went to the Juniper Gardens Children's Project at Kansas, where we were asking questions about language development in poor uh, African-American inner city kids. And uh, so we spent years, Betty Hart and I, who she was a preschool teacher, and then she got her PhD with me at Kansas. And but we've been working together for 35 years now, and she insisted that she wanted to see for her dissertation what children actually said in the free play situation at, in the preschool. And so we were taking language samples of actual children's actual, what they said when they didn't have to talk. I mean, when there was free play and they had choices. And, and, uh, and then we began to do the same measures on professor's children at the university preschool in the same settings professors and graduates, you know, this is where the at university preschools, that's who's there, primarily it was at that time. And so very advantaged, language advantaged kids and very uh, disadvantaged kids at the same time. And we began then to look at the differences and we found the differences, vast differences in how much they talked. And we found then we developed procedures, incidental teaching procedures to increase the spontaneous speech and the child initiations in the in our in the in, in the inner city preschool and we had the children in the poverty preschool talking as much as the professor's kids and using as many different words in a in a 15 minute sample you know 15 minute sample and so we were, I mean, uh, that, that was quite an accomplishment because it's, we're talking about how is it that you make speech pr language production and practice and interaction, uh, uh, you know, uh, make a preschool very rich in it. And, uh, without, and so, so our teaching procedures are called incidental teaching, which is capitalizing on the teachable moment, which is when the child initiated, then you elaborate it. You know, it's just, and so, but we still had that data of, of Betty began to say, we need to, she began to insist on, Betty's very stubborn, you see. And so, and, and so she kept saying, uh, we need to kind of look at the vocabulary growth, not just the number of different words in a 15 minute sample, but if we added all the words up, how big of vocabularies are we seeing cumulative as we add, as we sample more speech, and we add words that we haven't heard, we would begin to, then getting a growth slope as what's the likelihood of coming up with a word you hadn't heard as you sampled. And so there was a course, uh, and they, that we had enough language samples so that we could get the growth slope. And we found that though, even though the children were talking as much as the professor's children, if you add the vocabularies up, you got very different. You got a very different look, and so then we went three years of our intervention program, trying to change the vocabulary growth slope. Not any particular words, but the f rate at which children were exhibiting new words, showing up new words. What was the? And we did all the things that one would, you know, the normal things you would expect: field trips and discussions and so on, but still had no effect on those vocabulary growth slopes of the children. And the, the professor's children were adding words, new words, at a rate double the, 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 uh, that of the, of the inner city children. 
So that's where we said, look, we have these children for 20 hours a week or less, you know, what, what's going on in the rest of their lives and what was going on before we ever saw them? We didn't know that. And it's surprising to think you know, back on the fact that that, that information is not available. That we looked and said, well, what happens? What is actually going on in the daily lives of children? There's just nothing in the literature. There's no examination of that. And we said, well, I guess we better go back and look. And so that's the, so the notion of looking at children. But we also saying we're trying to see where those growth slopes start. And where are the early versions of it? What's the la la lawful function of vocabulary addition? And where you know, and so and we also wanted to not just see us and them, the top and the bottom, or something like that. We wanted to look at where's the middle, where's average, where's the. So we that's why when we began the project, we began uh, uh, making uh, you know look, using birth announcements in the Kansas paper and calling people, but we were kind of stratifying by socioeconomic status. So we got a full range from welfare all the way to professionals and everything in between in terms of SES. Um, and we stratified also for uh, Caucasian and African-American so that we got an equal representation of two, uh, th those two groups. But we wanted to sort of see what, what the middle was too, and that's it was it was so we were so glad we did after because we always kind of had this funny th I always had this funny thought that that everybody was like me except people who are in trouble you know and 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 realize that that's not true that we are all the people I know were talkative at a level that is so f different from average and we just kind of expect that that's the way people behave unless there's something, you know, they're dysfunctional or something like that. And to realize that's not true, that there's a whole range. And then, and then when we begin to take counting the data, and counting it up and looking at it, we found that, that it, well, it, that it isn't Socioeconomic. I mean, we, we always knew that that socioeconomic status isn't a thing. I mean, it's not a variable. I mean, it's a variable, but it's not a causal variable. There isn't anything in being rich or poor or having an income much that really accounts for very much what is going on, what's different that's correlated, that's associated with that. And it looks like, from what we can see, it's talkativeness. That the big discovery was, well, the first discovery was was kind of how much, I mean, answering the first question, which was what's going on in the regular home in the everyday life of children. And so now we can give you an average and standard deviation, around, you know, the, and the samples of the children we have about what's, what's average. And that's important information because when you think of looking at uh, what's going on in the average home, then you can compare that with daycare, for example. In my studies of daycare, uh, and in my own daycare centers, my infant and toddler daycare programs, I would be hard pressed to get an average amount of language experience, give an average amount of language experience to children in my daycare center. I could do it, but it would take a lot of attention and work because the average is about the children are receiving about 1200 words an hour directed to them. And so in my daycare center for toddlers, or infants, I would I would really have to be struggling to deliver that to you know the personal comments and discussion and, co and commentary to to the child. <laughs> so it's important to know kind of that general average because what's going on in the home. Then you can compare other things, orphanages and and uh, treatment programs and daycare centers and yeah, other kinds of places. Uh, but the but the notion of uh, the second discovery was really how big the differences were in amount of talking. We couldn't see it ourselves because 
there was just a lot of variability from day to day, you know, and that's what your impressions are because they're all talking about the same thing. They're babies, they're infants and toddlers. And so they're talking about the things that you talk to infants and toddlers about, about the topics and so on. And it wasn't until we began to count it up we could see over time that a given family on the average consistently talked more. And another family consistently talked very little, even though each, there was variability in each one. And it's that kind of, you know, as, as we need a, a microscope to see very things very small and we need a telescope to see things very far away, we kind of need a time scope and that's one of the issues of taking data, this kind of repeated samples, so that you can see things that are beyond your kind of the scope of your impressions, you know, so that you can kind of count them up and add them up. So, so that, so, but the discovery was, we weren't looking for that. We were looking for things like incidental teaching. We were looking for things like, we were assuming that parents were converting teachable moments into language enrichment and addition and so on, just like we had found, uh, uh, you know, that we could do in the preschool. And, and the thing that just, as we began to analyze the data, the thing that just overwhelmed us was the differences in amount that were so great that everything else was kind of left behind. That the differences in amount of talking between families was so large the average amount that the child say. The other thing is that parents talked a lot to their babies, talked a lot to their toddlers. And parents who talk very little to their babies, talk very little to their toddlers. That the amount of talking was not, had, didn't have much to do with the child side of the dance. That it was something about the family culture, microculture that went on from the very beginning. So a talkative mother who, with a seven month old baby was a talkative mother with a 36 month old toddler. And, and the same went for the very taciturn mother who talked very little with a seven month old baby was a very taciturn mother with a, with a toddler. Now, so, so that, that was our first kind of peer review. We had to, you know, there's an obligation in science to sort of say, let's, we got to submit this for, you know, for peer review. And, and, uh, and so the first article was to look at, the, was the reporting on the consistency from early to late in amount of talking. And, uh, and then we went ahead with the, with the book to, because there was so much information we had put together, you can't just do it in individual articles. And, uh, but the big news is really the big discovery, and I call it a discovery because we didn't know it was there, and we weren't particularly looking for it. We were looking for other things, and found this. And uh, and so our first book, we it was such a shock and kind of it was so startling to us that we decided to focus on it in the first book, writing up our, our, the the uh, the in, the uh, report of this of the research. And uh, so it was, and we titled the book Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Young American Children. And it was young children, young, you know, and, and we, by the way, you have to remember that we left, if you think about that, the children we looked at aren't children of, aren't abused, aren't neglected. These are healthy families who are confident enough to let you come in and wa watch their children in the family setting and so on. So, so this, the information we have leaves out a whole lot of children we're very worried about. You know, children of neglect and abuse and... Fits <laughs> the same spectrum and distribute across the same spectrum. Right. With respect to right. language exposure. Mm-hmm. We we think so, but <laughs> but there's we assume that it's those kids probably get less. Yeah. <laughs> more, you want to take a yeah. Of water? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, Uh, well, but you know, if you think about young, is important too. Who are we looking at here? So we looked at children. We started observing in the homes after calling and getting you know everybody comfortable with it and then visiting and so on. We started observing in the homes when the children were seven months old, 
and we were taking a little bit of data, but it was just mostly to get the process and everybody comfortable with this. We tried to seriously start taking data on by nine months old. Every month, different times of the day and evening and weekends and so on, uh, to get some estimate of what was actually going on in the homes. And so, so it was, but it was young children. It was, these are children who are at a unique time in their life. This is not a preschool child. This is not a kindergartner who can make their own sandwiches. This is a child who is a baby, an infant. You know, we started off before they were crawling and ended up when they were holding their own on their feet and holding their own in, in language and so on and toilet trained and eating adult foods and so on. So this period of time, is a massive amount of change in the child's life, mass in development, but it's also still a time when com their child is completely dependent on a caregiver for their safety and well-being, and and so uh, uh, they have the most access to an adult they will ever have in their life. You know, during this time, they have to because in our species, the children would not live unless they are being protected and watched over and taken care of and cared for by an adult in, in our species. So that's a unique time in our kind of life of, of a human child when they have the most opportunities they're ever going to have for interaction and dancing and communication and interchange with another, another person. Um, and they are, in some ways, the, they, the, they have a parent who is kind of one-on-one -on -one available to them, at least intermittently. So, so it's, uh, uh, so it, the young children, it's important to keep that in mind because as we translate to older children, it, the, the translation isn't, isn't, uh, it, because older children are out on their own, they're in the backyard, they're interacting with other people, they're doing things without the kind of a constant close proximity and, and intimacy, if you will, uh, with, with a parent. So this is kind of a unique period of time. And so uh, uh, everyday experience is sort of like, well, what is going on during that? Remember, a child is awake a baby is awake about a hundred hours a week. A toddler is awake about a hundred and ten hours a week. So if you think about it in terms of how many hours a day and seven days a week, hundred and ten hours is the opportunity time in the life of a young child or of any child. And the question is what's in those hundred and ten hours? And we, we have tended to think of the kind of the kind of light bulb occasions of I learned that and the aha phenomena and so on and 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 the particular skills and particular concepts that are important but what we found is the is the flood of things that are going on during the daily hours hour after hour after hour after hour was so different from one family to the other things we normally take for granted as kind of the background that's right. That's right. But the yeah. So that the if you think about it in terms of the height of the tide of language experience is either high or low, and and, um, and so and so the fact is that that the and it was a characteristic of the family. So it isn't just variability and so on. It's the fact that some families are talkative, and we found out that a parent who talked to the baby. Also talked a lot. To, talked a lot to the baby. Also talked a lot to the other children, and talked a lot to the other adults who, who were present intermittently. You could almost title your book the variations in the family learning environment. That's right. In that it's more it, about what's happening in the context of the exactly. Exactly. That's right. It's the yeah. That's right. It's the um, uh, it's the microculture of the family. That's. That seems to be where the talkativeness and taciturnity is. So, so the difference in amount was the big thing. Now, that difference was kind of roughly correlated with socioeconomic status. So, that the welfare parents, welfare families, were all taciturn. 
the professional you know, doctors and lawyers and such were all talkative, you know, the children. But there was a great variation in the middle, you know, all between that. And what we found was that the, when we began to look at outcome in terms of child vocabulary size, it wasn't SES, it was talkativeness. So we could sort it out. In other words, the, the relationship between amount of talking and child vocabulary size, child IQ test scores, and so on, was so was large, and there wasn't anything left over once you took that out. Once you turn them out of talking, there was no SES or race left, differences left after, after amount of talking. And so we think we got at what's in socioeconomic, that, the relationship between poverty or socioeconomic status and child achievement. At least young child achievement was core mechanism of how it's how it's that's right it was talkativeness. The other thing is that uh, uh, the uh, the things that we study as child you know child language people and child development people study lots of things that are correlated with child outcome. Motherese, okay, uh, topic richness. Uh, you know, I mean, anything you want to look at. We were, of course, looking for incidental teaching, the teachable moments, taking advantage of the teachable moment. That's right. These are particular. And it turns out all those are correlated with amount of talking automatically. Here's a secret that we didn't really fully understand when we wrote the first book was that the difference between business talk and chit chat. Okay, that, I'm just characterizing it because, you know, there's all sorts of gray areas in the middle, but think of it in those terms. Business is to get something done. Hold out your arms, stand there, stop, get down from there, come here, who gave you that, what are, you know, who, you know, in other words, it's, it's talking to accomplish something. Okay, and it turns out that the amount of business talk was a constant, no matter how much the family talked. In other words, if they talked a little, there was a certain amount, that same amount of, if they talked a lot, there was only that same, they didn't do more business talk when they talked more. The topics were different. It was about something else. So that if, if the parents only talked a little, it was all business talk. If they talked more, they didn't talk more business talk, they talked more chit-chat and gossip and commentary and so on, where all the richness that we study is there automatically. Business talk is simple, it's clear, it doesn't allow choices, it ha you know, it's adult directed, it's how it is you get something done, and it's, and it's so that the good stuff, the cognitively rich stuff, is not in business talk. And, and there's this kind of magic ecological shift that happens. And it's true even with very quiet, taciturn families that when they're talkative, their language is richer. You see, all these good stuff are more likely to come there. So it's true with everybody. And a certain base of, of instrumental that's right. communication that's going on. Across to all families, it's just part of the nature of being in a family. Uh, and with a one and one and two year old child, yeah, yes. One, two -year -old child, right. Yes. So that's got a got a gravity to it that creates a pretty level field across. But the, the big variation is, is what kind of talking is going on above and beyond that. That's right, exactly, and that's where and the implication then is is interesting because it says it makes it simpler because all you got to do is get people to talk more. You don't have to teach them how to talk. Because everybody knows how. Everybody does that. Everybody has rich, wouldn't it be better if, and couldn't you consider, and maybe it would, you know, I mean, all these options and all these complexities and all these is there in automatically in everybody's talk when they're chit chatting with a baby. The higher the degree of this non business talk, the That's more right. likely That's right. that will be. And the more of it is, the more esoteric it becomes, the more likely you to get more and more esoteric and com cognitively complex features. You know, and uh, uh, it, I, I re had a discussion with, with about theory of mind, and the person who has said there's evidence that says that children develop a theory of mind earlier if their parents use a lot of psychological terms and a lot of, you know, 
terms that relate to it, that they're, they develop the theory of mind in terms of being able to look at things from another person's perspective uh, early. And I said, but you're going to find, if you can get a reliable measure of those psychological terms, that they're going to be automatically a part of extra talk, that the more the parent talks, the more of those, so that that relationship, like all the others, are going to be about amount of talking. In your research, did you uh, have attributes for differentiating the kinds of words or the kind of um, amplitude or level of engagement the, the, as opposed to uh, you know, language that's directed peripheral to them? I mean, did, you, did you make those kind of distinctions? <coughs> Yes, we have we have a lot of data in a lot of ways of doing that. But by and large, what we decided to look at was words addressed to the child. Okay, rather than we have data, we have all the information. Rather than words whizzing by. In the no, air. but but we have that too. We have it. How much? What's said in the kid's present? But we decided to focus on probably the more meaty part, which is the words addressed to the child. But by and large, we didn't go back and look at the other part because what we saw was it's so correlated with amount of talking. I mean, the amount of language, the uh, language that's going on not addressed to the child is related in the family. It's the same family, talkative family to the child is a talkative family to each other. And so we didn't go back and say, well, we now need to subcategorize the, the more remote you know the language that's passing without the uh, without the without it being a part of the dance with the child, and b because that's that's important, I'm sure, but it's so related to yeah, it's clearly in the, the, that which the child is effectively in, in interested in and engaged yeah. in because they're being addressed to them. It, it, yeah, it's going to be the have a much more powerful, rich impact and effect. Right. Yes, and and but the. Uh, but it was the inability to sort that out probably in terms of its, we couldn't find, probably find another, the relationship would be the same if we just looked at the words addressed to each other in the child's presence in terms of the amount of talking and the amount of words would be the, would be the thing. The, the other thing that we found was when we look at the child, the child begins to talk, use words, and there are a couple of night kind of interesting markers that people didn't have a good handle on, but that uh, at 19 months on the average, half of the child's utterances have a word in them. That's the time in which words have, have hit that particular point where half of them have, have half utterances are all turns that the child takes as, as a word in it. And at 28 months on the average, the child is talking as much as their parents. Okay, so that there's a growth in terms of the, just a couple of numbers. But, but thinking about the way we look at the child vocabulary growth, you know, we're looking at uh, a growth curve. And so we used not just amount of words at any particular, you know, vocabulary. We looked at the growth of each child's vocabulary from within our own data. And there's a growth curve and we can plot a, a function of not just the first start and the steepness, but when it bends over and stabilizes, you begin to add words at a kind of a predictable rate. That's a particular number we use for language growth, you know, vocabulary growth. It's the slope at which it's growing. And, but when the child, the amount of talking grows also, just the amount of talking grows in terms of words used and bends over when it hits the amount of talking in the family. That's fascinating. Yeah. So the child's pr uh, expressive language experience is linked then in closely intrinsically to the receptive language experience. A talkative family, the child ends up being talkative. A taciturn family, the child ends up being taciturn. Not because the child is counting but because of what they're talking about. The child in a taciturn family is only talking about business. You know, it's only when things need to get done and... Uh, the family cultural interface about the kind of exchange that's, that's right. that they're becoming culturated to. That's right. 
th this brings up something really fascinating to me that we didn't touch on in our phone conversation, which was this slope that you just described of the of coming into vocabulary, becoming a talker. That's right. There was a point you mentioned twenty eight months, uh, whatever it is. The, but was there a correlation between the um, <clears throat> Where was this, there was a threshold that you're describing uh -huh. of where children came up to a point where they matched up with their parents and they started to uh, take on that kind of language behavior. Right. Where was that? Was the range that that was happening? Uh, it, it, the average is 28 months is when the amount of child utterances and the amount of parent utterances intersected in terms of per hour. And you could see a correspondence uh, between the amount of language exposure they had up to 28 months and the kind of behavior. That's right. But no, but it was the height, how much they were talking yes. hit that level and then leveled off at when as soon as it hit the level that the parents, that had parents had been talking to them. I mean, all of our measures, the parents talk a certain amount, the child's amount of word use talk would grow and then level off at whatever the amount that's going on in the family. I mean, going, this is happening around 28 months. That's right, a, a taciturn family. Yeah, that's right, about tw in the average 28 months is when they hit the, the, uh, the level of talk that, they're, that was common to their... They're synced up with the family that's right. language system. So and at that point, but that was the second, at that point, then the amount, their growth stopped. They leveled off in terms of the amount of, amount of word... This is, this is because that's, and what you end up with, see, this is what we're, what you end up with is a taciturn child from a taciturn family. Now, when they have, see, and it's not just because they're, it's kind of the issue of don't talk, it's they don't have any commentary and gossip and chit chat and pointing out and adding words on top of things, you know, in life. Um, and so they, when they have children, they're going to be taciturn parents. You see, it's that notion of talkativeness and taciturnity is a kind of a family microculture that's passed along from one generation to the act to the next. Uh, it, it learned by one generation from the that's next, right. In terms of the kind of uh, infrastructure. Well, what are you doing with language? What are you doing with language? You know, it's the the notion of if it's business. I mean, the, the business language is something that a guy, I mean, it's a guy kind of a concept. We, as a human beings, we use language to gang up on our enemies or to co collaborate and get something else done. And it's, it's business. It's how we coordinate our activities to some end. Women's perspective, I mean, I don't want to overly characterize this, but it's the perspective of a mother is dancing. Its language is just chit chat and fun. It isn't about something else. It's about itself. It's about, and so the best, best, the best characterization of the extra language is not about something else, but dancing. In and of itself, it's the, it's the reinforcer, if you will. It's the, it's the object and the point of it all. And that's what seems to be what the extra language is, is the, it's stay and play. It's continuing the dance. It's taking extra turns, not about getting something done. And that's conversation. It's not about getting something done. And I keep, I keep, you know, I, I, I'm so startled with that because I was startled with by that. I, you know, my idea of language was always the kind of the guy thing of we, we, you know, it, it's business. It's getting things done. It's coordinating and so on. But now I look at, for example, in the airports, and listen to cell phone conversations, which is supposed to be business. And it's chit chat. I mean, most of it is there's very little business, and and there's a whole lot of commentary about the weather and about other things and about so on and and chit chat. It it's not about getting anything done. It's kind of strengthening. It's grooming sort of social network. He said, you know, strengthening social relationship, and that's what so I think conceptually important is that is that the cognitive important things are on, ride, uh, kind of ride on that carrier wave. 
of social grooming, of social dance, of social exchanges. And so if you have a taciturn mother, it's not that she's dancing without words. She's not dancing. With our species, we never saw um, uh, somebody dealing with a baby a lot without using words. They always use words in interchange. It's the surface self. That's right. And so what we're looking at is the is taciturnity is really uh, kind of a n not dancing very much. And 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 somehow I think I'm excited about it because if we begin to wrestle with it that way, we don't keep misdirecting our parenting programs into, we, well, you have to have this and you have to do that and you have to you know, be more positive and you have to say, well, you know, automatically if you talk more, you will be positive. I mean, that's the notion of that's where all the affirmations and so on are is in the extra stuff. Turn, turn up the, the exchange. That's right. The bath and, uh, and the rest of the things go with it. Yeah, that's right. But not the not the prohibitions, not the business, not to stop that and get down from there, and not the stuff that feels Aging bad. That's right. Yeah, business doesn't feel good. I mean, business is you're kind of like do it, or you got to you know. There's something efficiency. A parent to child, do it. Hold out your arms. Come here. Stand there. Uh, I want to come back to that. That's yeah. the most powerful point. So you know, I. I'd heard of a lot of your work and, and people that point, Bonnie, who you'll meet later, uh, really thumped me here at the NCFL to, uh, to seek you out. And so I, I'd heard about the language correspondence issues of your work um, everywhere we travel, anyway. Mm -hmm. But when we were on the phone, the thing that was one of the really powerful jewel in everything is the correspondence between language exposure and its implications for positive affect. Yes. Yeah. And so I yes. want to come back and really drill into that. Right. So as we progress through the interview, I'm, I'm, you're getting animated. It's feeling yeah, right. I appreciate mm -hmm. the, the, the great energy. I, I want to uh, give you a chance to make sure that kind of at a narrative level, you've covered what you think is important. <laughs> And then I want to drill in okay. type questions and get kind of bite level answers that I can use for different okay. parts of what we're doing. So back on the track that we were on about the more general narrative side of this, and telling the story of, of how this unfolded. Right. Uh, is there a place in there that you'd like to pick up, or would that transition? Yeah, right. there are a couple things because there's one thing that it just uh, you know that this the book was came out in 1995, so 10 years it's been out. And, and people are beginning to use it, and everybody's turning to it and commenting on it and using it as kind of background. But nobody's ever doing more of it. It's like Betty said, you know, Betty is, you know, is in her 70s, and I'm in my late 60s. And so I'm like saying, why aren't people doing, asking the, you know, kind of the natural history question more question. <laughs> ab about about what is going on. I mean, we know there are all sorts of other kids. There's Hispanic, but there's other ages. The, the question about how does a, how do youths spend their lives, their time? What is the kind of the nature of the experience that goes on in the 110 waking hours of other of, of people? And now it's 10 years, actually closer to 20 years later, you know, in terms of from, uh, you know, the, when we started taking the data. And it hasn't been, nobody, and I, and I know one of the reasons is that because it's so hard. Uh, you know, I mean, our, you know, every hour of observation, home, you know, tape recording and making notes about who said what to whom, so you got all the adjacency and, and, and uh, every hour of observation took seven hours of transcription time. And every, and then it took another seven hours, and then every time there was another adult in the home, and added another hour to the transcription time when there was somebody else, you know, visiting or something like that. And then, and then it takes another seven or eight hours of, of coding and, you know, and, and everything has to be reliability checked because it's all, you have to have your systems right in place. Otherwise, you just get a lot of noise. You get so much error noise. And so you and your work gets thrown out because it doesn't meet certain standards. It doesn't have the same traction on the research community. That's right, but it, but you can't see things. It's just so much fuzz and no, you know, it, noise in the system. You can't see relationships. I mean, you know, if we see a relationship between amount of extra talk 
and IQ test scores of 0.78. Now, that's amazingly high. It's as high as, but you see, the test retest reliability of the Stanford Binet is 0.81. And our rely, but our data was, you know, high 90s. Anytime you wanted to look at anything, it was 90.95, 96 in terms of inter-observer agreements or split half reliabilities, you know, month, odd months and even months. But if you multiply those two together, you can't see anything more than 0.78. You see, what I'm saying is that the more noise you have in the system, the the weaker your relationships that you can see are. And so, so it's so Betty's insistence. He said, "If we're going to do all this work, we're going to make it good." And we, and it's kind of like just agonizing over ke keeping on top of checking and checking and cross-checking, building computer programs for coding and so on that were expert systems and would suggest and then you would change. In other words, to give structure that it reduced the error variance. You know, the, it, it, and so you can understand why people don't do it because it's a, it's, but it's a shame. I mean, it's a shame that we don't ask this question about anything we do about kids and people and so on and say, how is their lives full? I mean, what is their lives full of? You can ask that question cheaper than we asked it because you don't have to, ma we measured everything. We counted everything. You can do, you know, yeah, codes. There's a lot more to mine in the data that you've got. That's, oh yeah, that's right. And, but the, but it's the question, the natural history question that, that we've been trying to operate understanding things without having any natural history, without actually asking the question, what do people actually do? How much, what goes on in people's lives? You know, so. It, it's amazed me. I mean, we, we've talked to people like sociologists or yeah. economists, and some of them don't know you by name, or know, know yeah. your work by, uh, uh, by name, but, the, but they know the basic gist of the work. It's spread to, like I said, a Nobel yeah. Prize economist, uh, yeah. a sociologist, uh, Russ Whitehurst at the IES, uh, right, Lee right. Lyon at the NICHD. It's just become part of the background that everybody's referring to this. That's right. But but there's not a lot of um, sense, not a, lot of, not a lot of translation into um, practice yet in terms of trying to take advantage of what's been learned here and not a lot of replication despite right. the attribution of its importance. So it's a That's big right. mystery to me. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's a mystery to me. I mean, it's not a mystery because it's so hard. But, you know, sort of like and very few people have, you know, Betty and I have been partners and we do a good partnership arrangements. And, you know, she, she has certain things that I don't have, which is detail and persistence <laughs> and sort of, and I have this, you know, sort of, I, and so the two of us have worked together so long, but it's that, it's that having somebody who is willing to put in the time and to take this kind of data. Now, other fields, I, I don't know, other places, there used, there used to be this long tradition of natural history and biology where people would count things and, stamp, you know, sort things out and so on and spend lots of time and loving attention on it, but but we don't in terms of 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 child and you know human human activities and so on, and and that's my I mean that's a subtext, but it's one that keeps worries me a great deal it worries me because Betty said it may never ever be done again, and I was like surely not Betty no, but then I think about it and I said she might be right, you know that would be a shame but it's. After the interview, I'd like to talk with you about the mechanics of that a little bit more because it seems to me that there may be things that have happened in the intervening time that could make yeah. some of the collection and some of the processing. Yeah, I've, the I've seen some hints that yeah. say, gee, if you start this, you know, maybe. Yeah, but, it, but it's like, you know, the, the uh, National Institute, you know, I mean, why Russ Whitehurst? You know, I mean, Russ, I know him. I mean, he knows the work. and. Why aren't they saying, gee, maybe we should do that some more? Because they, the majority of what you're talking about, this is one of the reasons that we're yeah. having this conversation today, in my sense, is, uh -huh. is that they, they've come to a, um, a kind of t uh, institutional assumption that there are certain things that are happening outside the reach of our institutions. Right? The things that are going on at home are outside the reach of our institutions. Right, yeah. So we're going to focus on how to improve what our institutions are doing. Right. 
and that's very short-sighted. We got to change that. And your your some of the most powerful ammunition argumentation for why we ought to change that. Right. But it's but but the 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 Russ and Reed and the people that are on the institutional side. I mean, I've talked to them. They're pretty much like you know look. Parents, we're not going to concern ourselves. We're going to concern ourselves with what the institution can do. That's right. But they don't understand how much institutional effort is going into compensating for variations that are happening before right. that we could do something about much more efficiently if we just gave that the right attention. Right. Yeah, you know, when I, I talk to teachers quite a bit, and, you know, I always say, well, this is, too, this is younger than your kids. You know, but... Uh, uh, but you need to be an advocate for children in your community, and the message of p parenting and home and intervent. You know, is, even if you're not doing it, it's you're you're an advocate for children in your community, and you in the, and what what you need to do is to be promoting parent assistance, parent training, and so on. Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Or is there any? Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to think if there was any point, <coughs> but the the narrative part, you know, the the big thing is the accumulation of the. It isn't just the average amount; it's the fact that there's consistency within a family and amount of talking. So any good stuff, anything you look at, adds up to real differences. So that you know, if you look at words. You know, by the time you ask, by the time the children are four, if we look at the differences, you know, the difference between 48 million words addressed to the child and 30 million and 15 million, you know, those are massive differences by way before the child is in kindergarten. And those seem to be related to, I mean, those are tightly related to vocabulary size, you know. And so that's, it's that notion of, of, of language and words and vocabulary size that is, you know, big in terms of cognitive implications. But it's also the other th effect, what we said was extra words are feel good. They're not business. They're, they have affirmations in them. They have active listening. They have restatements of the child's. They are responsive turns. And so if we think about it in terms of the emotional life of the child, if, we hit, if a child's in a taciturn family, they are apt to hear prohibitions that they're wrong more often than they're right from their parents. Not, and, and in a very talkative family, their family might, they might hear they're wrong that often, but they'll hear that they're right five or six more times more often. They're still hearing that they're wrong. That's right. Instrumental on all sides. That's right. But they're now having these positive counterbalance. That's right. Things. Exactly. And I think about a lifetime battery average of that, you know, sort of like in terms of, of uh, you know, uh, you've heard 750,000 times you're right by the time you're, you're four, and you've heard 120,000 times you're wrong. Versus heard it hearing 250,000 times you're wrong and 120,000 times you're right. Those are lifetime. You can't overcome those with positive experience. Yeah, it's, it's not just the, um, I would think it's not just the uh, conclusion right wrong, but it's the, uh, uh, the amount of time dwelling in a positive affect right. of engaged space. versus a negative engaged space. That's right. All of the variations that are going on inside okay. of that. And that that's what then it really hit me. Right. Probably the most powerful thing. What is the, what is the uh, implications for this variation of language exposure right. to the threshold of self-esteem, of, of, of self-positivity in right. the development of children? Yeah, and you turn it around to say the implications, the second order implications in terms of like child initiations of conversation and interaction. If most of the time you're your parent makes you feel bad, then you're gonna, your initiations are only going to be when you have to. Okay? And the notion of being talkative and chatty is going to bring out, it, when you begin to graduate a little bit more from your home life, it's going to bring out a more complicated, so the more complicated your language is when you display it and chattiness and so on to other people, the more complicated their response is going to be 
from you. And so that, that the ch nature of what's happening with the child is probably then, because the child ends up being the author of their own educational opportunity, I mean environment. You know, they start 60, all, you know, children on the average start 60% of the interactions from the time they're babies, you know, with, with their parents. And the, the notion of thereafter, the child's going to be initiating and starting. So did you find a correlation? I mean, that would seem that, that there would be more initiation until the language sync, and then the initiation would reflect the language sync. Yes. Yeah? Yes, that's, that's right. But you see, what's happened, of course, the talkative parents are backing off, and the child is initiating and taking on more floor holding turns and commenting more and doing more on the child's side. On the taciturn side. The child's starting off more initially and withering as they sync up at language. Yeah. yeah. Sense, unfortunately, it makes sense. One had to do with, did you do any comparison between siblings? I mean, I think it's implicit in what you said, but let's be explicit. In other words, um, you, you watch more than one child come through a, a family and saw the pattern repeat? No, we did not. We, But we saw, of course, older children and occasionally the child we were watching being dethroned as a new baby came along, but we were targeting that one baby. But the, the siblings are what we found, because since we were recording everything that was said in the baby's presence, so we were also recording things between parent and other siblings and siblings and parent and so on. And uh, But that was the overall conclusion where we didn't pursue, I mean, of all the thousands of d data analysis things, we didn't pursue that because <coughs> that was so tightly correlated, the amount of talking there was so tightly correlated with the amount of talking of mother to child, right. mother to baby, so the uh, target baby. So, as I said, we, you know, it was the, seemed to be a characteristic of the family. Good, yeah, that's what I meant by implicit, yeah, that's what it, my sense of it was. So, the, the other thing had to do with um, vocabulary. Um, you were talking about you're counting words. Are you also counting diff the differences in words? How many differences? Well, we, would, we would construct the vocabulary as the data came in for the child, adding new words into that child's cumulative dictionary. Okay. Uh, you know, and so, and it was the growth of that dictionary that we were tracking in terms of the vocabulary growth. And so, did you do any differentiations between? Uh, you know, uh, weighting differences between new words in the vocabulary growth and just w and words that they were already automatic and familiar with? Oh, oh yeah, because what we would do is, uh, well, let's see, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to th respond to that in the right way. Um, we would collect, uh, uh, let's see, we're interested in, we were interested in, you know, ending up with two kind of several categories. What is the language use? And that's the amount of talkativeness, use, number of contentive words per hour. And then vocabulary growth, which is the slope at which new words were being added. And, and so it's a very esoteric measure because it, it doesn't tell you, I mean, it breaks it free from how much it is. It's the slope at which new words are coming into play that we have not seen before. After the first growth, when you've got a kind of a steady state asymptote, non-zero asymptote, what is the slope of that asymptote? So it's a fairly, it's a fi very sophisticated way of looking at vocabulary growth. Uh, and, you've, and you've got um, the data showing the um, exposure to new vocabulary from the seventh month old to the 28th month old and, and the, the slope of takeoff in, uh, in, in using vo new vocabulary. Uh, you, you're making, a, you're making a, uh, a relationship at a molecular level that we didn't make, which is, I mean, we could, but because the data's there, but, but uh, what I, uh, we were looking at not the particular words, uh, you know, not any particular words, but the rate at which words, new words, new were words. coming into. Okay. It, so, 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 so think about it in terms of of the difference between a skill test and G. You know, in other words, what is the si what is the size of everything? You know, what's the size of everything and anything that's that's there? And so the. Uh, the growth of any word, so that how often do we see a word we haven't heard before as we accumulate it up, 
what there's a lawfulness about that. There's a sampling, you know, issue. But then, in a sense, there's stability. There's a, and that's we had a, a, a person who's a statistician expert in growth curves, and it, we call it a Thyssen C. And he's named David Thyssen. He's at North Carolina now, but he, in a sense, used our data, helped us use our data, and constructed the different uh, uh, three-point uh, equations for each curve having to do with onset, having to do with maximum growth, and having to do with stability, you know, at the end. So there's a kind of a slightly S-shaped curve. And it's that last one that we in, we ended up using as our primary measure. Uh, and it, it's, of course, correlated with IQ 0.9 something or other. I mean, it's, a, you know, and the, the amazing thing is that is that after all that work, it's correlated with the last three months, 34, 35, and 36 month samples at that age, uh, our samples, the number of contentive words the child used per hour across those three months was correlated 0.92 with the is e elegant esoteric uh, analysis of slope, of vocabulary growth slope. When you have a correlation of 0.92, it's a you're measuring the same thing. I mean, it's like, wow, that means you can get a quick estimate of the child's vocabulary growth slope by another measure that's easier to get. Once, once, you, once you got that pattern mark. That's right. Once you figured it all out, now you can go back and you say... You test it, you beat it yeah. out to whatever you yeah. do to have it as a reliable... Yeah. Is there been anybody that, that's argued with this and said, wait a minute, this just doesn't make sense, this doesn't work, this is incredible? Is, is, there, is there been anybody that stood up and pounded at this and, and been critical? Or no, the, the, the people, who, the first response, blush response is usually you only have 42 kids. I mean, you know, is, what kind of a sample is that? And the notion of saying, well, you know, I mean, you can say, well, God, think how hard it is to get 42 kids. You know, we've got 28,000 pages a day, you know, sort of like, a, you know, sort of. Um, but, but it really is, we've got enough. We've yeah. got enough on enough kids that are represented across a That's range of kids. Really and incredible. then you can talk about where you're at and what it's related to uh, without, with some assumption that in a sense it's going to, that those relationships are going to hold. You know, there's enough of it. There's test retest reliabilities. There's, you know, in, in terms of the, we got enough data to say we now have good look at those 42 kids in terms of and the best estimate anybody's had of what goes on in their homes. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so let's, let's go to um, the correlations. Okay. Particularly the... Um, the, first of all, the difference in, in language exposure, just graphic okay. across the spectrum. If you just want to just do overall amount of words, you know, it's like, you know, the 0.6 or something like that to the child's vocabulary size at the end, okay, measured our way. Okay, if you want to look at it a little more subtly in terms of X business talk versus non-business talk, since there's some variability. Okay, non-business talk, which means all the extra stuff, and of different categories that are related to the, the relationship between the, that, the, what we saw parents doing of non-business talk when the children are one and two years old, okay, correlates 0.78 with their Stanford Binet IQ test scores at age three, 36.78, okay. We, f okay, we, uh, we have to kind of remember, then we eliminate the relationship of the welfare, the us and them. We eliminate the professional, you know, doctors and lawyers and such, and we eliminate the welfare, and we just get middle America, white collar and blue collar, you know, jobs and so on, and working class. Say, okay, is the, what's the relationship between the extra talk and the child's IQ scores for just that middle America? 0.77. Okay. We follow the kids into the third grade, okay, nine years old. Of course, you know that's an important moment in child language because that's when the curriculum shifts to reading, okay. Okay, <clears throat> have we given the Peabody picture vocabulary test? 
the relationship between what we saw, the extra talk of the parents when they're one and two years old, presumably it's a measure also of the family culture of talkativeness, okay, and the Peabody picture vocabulary test at age nine is 0.77. If we eliminate us and them, and we only look at the middle, it's still 0.76. In other words, the relationships, I mean, the relationships are so strong, you know, in terms of outcome. And that's, that's the other discovery, how strong the talkativeness, especially when you sub, you know, you cut out the business talk, the chit chat, the commentaries, the, with, um, Child intellectual outcome is, you know, as, as strong as the data will, the, the, the measures will allow. Well, no, it just seemed to come out. Okay. Um, let's go back and, and, and talk about the, um, the language exposure differences. So we've got the, this SES spectrum, we've got uh, children uh, across the spectrum. We're measuring the amount of uh, words that they're experiencing across this span. Okay. Something quick on this staff. Okay. If you looked at if you looked, looked at the words addressed to the child, you know the the differences in say the range of differences. Of, you know, kind of a taciturn family is about you would be 500 words an hour addressed to the child. The lowest was 150 words, but you know, sort of down into that's a low range, you know, in that area. The average is around 1,200 words an hour, hour after hour addressed to the child. The profession, people who make their money with their mouth, they're living with their mouth, are talk, you know, doctors and lawyers and people we know are 21, 2,200 words an hour. The highest is 3,600 words an hour. Can you imagine 3,600 words an hour addressed to a child, hour after hour, all the waking hours of the child's life? I mean, those differences are just huge. And then you add them up, and you end up with you know differences in the, in the na neighborhood of like 50 million words. By the time the child's four, you extrapolate them over the waking hours. 50 million words a child will have heard, or 25 million words on the average, or 30 million words on the average, or 15 or 12 or 13 million words. In other words, the differences in the, in the, by the time the child is four and into preschool, into kinds of, that we begin to pick up our seriousness about organized programs and so on for them, their language differences, experience differences are just so vast, you know, 50 million words versus, you know, 13 million words. That's how big the differences are already by then. Excellent. So now that corresponds to the IQ. That corresponds That's to the, the And, and the, the, the best, and, and, the, and the direct measures of the child's vocabulary. The direct, you know, set from our samples, we can accumulate, you know, the vocabulary, vocabulary growth slopes. Okay, back to affect. <coughs> there's no uh, there's no equivalent to the uh, vocabulary or Stanford Binet test that's measuring self esteem or emotional yep. that you've got any correspondence with here. So what we've yep. got is whatever we want to make out of out of that out of that. Okay, right. still think it's incredibly powerful. Okay, but remember the differences are are huge. You know there, and the because if you we counted affirmations, you know, as sort of like classified affirmations as, as not only praise statements, you know, good, I like that, or something like that, but also active listening, restating what the child said, expanding on what the child said. In other words, it is the parent hearing, the, responding to the child affirmatively, saying, I heard you and I approve well, yeah right that's right uh, that's right and and then the prohibitions are no don't stop wrong you know in other words the, any indication that the child was needed to change or stop or do you know what, what they were doing and the rates are you know we we look at the recommendations for parenting and the average parent was doing two affirmations per one prohibition and but the uh, 
but the people who talked a lot were doing six affirmations per one prohibition. And the people who didn't talk very much were doing a few more prohibitions than they were affirmations. So the child, what the child was hearing in terms of uh, overall was, uh, you know, the, the um, again, that adds up. That's a constant consistency of the family. And that adds up to an incredible lifetime batting average differences for the child. I mean, language has to be there. I mean, it's a massively important media uh, medium of experiencing ourselves. Right. Yeah. And so, a lot of the emotional give and take that's happening has got a verbal surface to it, at least. Right. So, when you look at it this way, what we're talking about is, is that having this is a significant indicator of the emotional atmosphere a child's growing. That's right. We, but but you see, what we did is we misled people. We c collapsed that into something called feedback tone. Now. What we did is then we lost the information that way because the information really was prohibitions don't change with talking, but affirmations do. So the more you talk, the more positive it is, but it's because affirmations are going up, not because prohibitions are going down, you see. And so it's the, it is that funny thing that we tend to do with data that gives us, loses information where the real information was, wait a minute, business talk stays the same. You know, stop that, don't get down from there, don't do that, you're wrong. <laughs> you know, that's, just, and, and, and the parent who was talking 3,600 words an hour was doing about the same amount of that as the parent who was talking 150 times words an hour. It just doesn't make any difference. It's a one and two year old child. There's a certain amount of get down from there and stop. <laughs> and I told you not that you have to do. But it's, but the positives is that it's an automatic, because when you talk more, it's about something else, and chit chat, and it isn't important. It isn't. You don't have to get anything done. You're comedy, but it's incredibly rich. It's laying words on top of things, and it doesn't have the same level of judgment, and yeah, control, right. and therefore negative. Right. But but the better way I think of looking at it is in terms of dancing. Because when it's not business, business is to accomplish something else. Everything else is dancing. Where dancing itself is what's important. It's the reinforcer. It's the, you know, and it's positive. It's affirmative. It's flexible. It has, and it has all of the features that we child development people study and correlate with outcomes, which is, you know, that the mother ease. I mean, you use mother ease to a baby when it's not important. You don't use mother ease when it's, it's important, it's business. It's, so all the things we correlate and we say there's a ratio, when we get it into a ratio, then we misdirect our parenting programs into, you gotta teach a different, to be a, have a different style. Be more positive, be less negative. And, and you say, no, no, all you have to do is get them to talk more. Automatically it will be more positive. These programs are so, there's such inertia behind the content rather than the orientation. What you're really That's talking about is an orientation that self uh, extending and opening towards having this kind of uh, conversational relationship going on rather than uh, in particulars inside of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> go back to the 28 month thing for a second. It seems to me that if you collapsed these different vectors of information and came down to this, what we're saying is, is that. When that child hits that plateau at around 28 months, that's incredibly predictive of, of everything that's going to happen to them. Relative a to absolutely. Say yeah. that as powerfully as you feel comfortable with. Okay. It, it looks like there's something that happens when a child, their language stabilizes in terms of, and it's not just the amount, it's, a, it's the topics. The child begins to talk about the things that they've been talked to about. So if it's only business, that's what they end up talking about. If it's about all this chit chat and gossip and commentary and what ifs and maybes and so on, that's, that's what. It's conversation, the difference in conversation and just getting things done. And that's what, if, that's what the family microculture. So that a poverty, I mean, a family who's taciturn and will in a sense, end up with a child who's taciturn, but not just because they're counting words, but because 
that's what they're talking about. Simple, it only talk when it's, when it's important to talk, when you have something, you're trying to get something done. And that's what sends the stable. I mean, when you begin that, then you say, then you're sending that child into the world. What I want to hit here is, is, the, is the particular window, as best you, as most <coughs> as you can be with that, of the 28 months, whatever window, whatever you want to say about that. But what we're saying is that children are coming up to a point, they're almost like they're uh, a species evolving to adapt right, right. to the environment. They're That's in. right. They get to a certain point where they threshold. That's right. They and threshold they at, so they, w- when they hit about the level they've been talked to. The word utterances that the parents have been, if you count it simplest way, con- try to free the content by simply saying ter- parent turns, utterances that have a word in them, I mean, a word utterances, and the child's word utterances grow and then level off at the time, at the same point that the, where they hit the amount per hour that their parents uh, word, ut- word utterances to them. And it's that if a parent are very talkative, the child grows to that level and levels off up there. That's good. Do, the same, do that again, but come right up to the time, that 28 months the or whatever. You 28 want. months is the average time when the child's uh, frequency of word utterances grows. And then 28 months is the time, the average time they hit the rate, the amount that their parents are talking to them, the word utterances per hour. And, or, and whether it's low or high, it's... That's, but they they level off then at that point. So if we collapse that, I mean, there's a, the children are coming up to um, model and reflect the kind of language environment that they're developed in. That's right. They achieve this plateau at around 28 months, and it has incredibly predictive um, relationship with how they're going to do with language and reading and everything else. So just <coughs> all those three points. Okay. Going. Well, I... You know, the, the notion of the three things, the, okay, we're dealing with a learning mechanism of observational learning in terms of picking up vocabulary. That's the only place it can come from what you hear. That's the only place it can come from. Okay. It's ob- but it's not practice learning. It's observational learning. Okay. How many words in context have you heard? Gives you the experience background for, you know, to have a large vocabulary. Language practice, in terms of what you practice doing, is a different learning mechanism. It's doing things and making it work, and and so on. And and it's it's, and you know, it's the responsiveness of the world to what you're doing. It's a different learning mechanism, and so both of those, but the, both those intersect. So if you hear a lot, you've been talked to a lot, you end up matching the practice level of the level you hear. So you end up your experience, your expressive language and your receptive language are high or low. You know, and that seems to be then a trend that kind of is characteristic of you. You carry that with you in terms of, you know, from the point of about 28 months on where you have matched your child, your family's culture in terms of how much you talk and what you talk about. So um, we've talked about the Stanford Binet correspondence. We've talked about the picture vocabulary correspondence, um, which, are both, which both have implications for reading. But, but you didn't do any tests that were specific to reading. They're buried in the, those two. And those two no. are predictable. Yeah. But what we're trying to do is, is try to make as powerful a statement as we can about right. the, the implication chaining right. that's going from this okay. come up to 28 months and that is it got an right. incredible okay. predictive effect on, on okay. what's going on. L- let me I, I look at it like I look at it th- that way too. The importance in terms of vocabulary items and reading and cracking the code and so on, you know, that you need to the oral if you're familiar with the word it's in your oral vocabulary and spoken and, and listening vocabulary, then the translation of these symbols into that word that you already know, that concept you already know is probably it, it, that's an important issue in terms of learning to read. But I think about it in terms of G. G intelligence, you know. I think that the size of your vocabulary is G. I mean, it's what you call on, not any moment, not, but in a sense to everything. It's like what you've got to draw on. 
is the size of that vocabulary, and it cuts across all tasks, all situations, all circumstances. And I think that's the kind of the, I think we got at something that people are find, have been finding in terms of G, the, the cross-correlation between particular tasks and skills and so on, that in a sense, it, the notion of how big is your vocabulary, how big is the toolbox you have to draw on. Keith Stanovich puts it exactly the same way. Vocabulary right. is the toolbox. Yes. Right? And that um, from a reading point of view, we know that the vocabulary thing's having three levels of impact. One, it's certainly the background that the code, like a, yeah. like a player piano is playing to, to evoke so that you can recognize and understand the words that you're experiencing. It's also creating the uh, uh, sphere in which your nervous system, the neurons in your brain are differentiating your ability to track with complex sound distinctions that map to vocabulary. Yes. The phonemic awareness, which is so much a part of. Um, <coughs> And, and, and it also connects to the more vocabulary that you use, and the likely, likelihood is that the, the greater the dimension of abstractness and the speed of processing. Mm -hmm. So there's all of these levels that right. in which the vocabulary environment, the environment in terms of vocabulary that children are developing in, is exercising the brain in very fundamentally important ways. And it's that's why I think there's such a strong footprint correlation across right. these different spectrums that you're discussing. Uh, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, but I keep thinking about that 150 words an hour family and the 3,600 words an hour family, the two ends of the least talkative and most talkative. And think about that child's life. Now, it's going through 110 hours, waking hours a week. There are things to see, there are things to go on. And, but that 3,600 word has got words added on top of all that. So in a sense, what's going on, the complexity of just the input, you know, is that's going on in parallel with everything else that's going on. Now, the child from the 150 word doesn't have that complexity. They're just seeing what's happening, a little bit of dancing, a little bit of interaction. But there are so few words that are added on as stimulation as association to th what's going on. So there's a whole symbolic level, you know, in, from that talkative uh, of input that is not, and again, not thinking about the specific item, you know, that thing and learning that particular skill and learning that word and that concept, but everything, but just this incredible overlay of, of 110 hours a week. The bath isn't about the molecule of water. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. The carrier wave is not the same as the uh, content on the surface. That's right. Yeah. But it's what gives meaning to the content on the surface. Of yes. It. Yes. Yeah. And the other part, though, is to remember that it's not intentional. The parents aren't intending to teach. I mean, that's what's so amazing. And nobody was sitting down and drilling their kid. Nobody was. They, if they tried it once, it didn't work. And that's sort of like, I didn't do it again. And we saw, you know, occasionally, you know, people were just talking and dancing. And the talkative ones were, in a sense, interchanging and they didn't, weren't making anything complete. They wouldn't make the child repeat it. They weren't doing that. They were just dancing with the child. With, with, to the extent there's any intention, it's to not be uh, prematurely terminating. That's right. Yeah, yeah. and that was what the that was what the re rewards were for each other, reinforcers in the this game. This is the problem. You can't yeah. translate this into scripted behaviors. That's right. You want to bring about an orientation shift, yeah. not the subscription to a to script. Right. That's com You know that that is it's that point that says, you know, where do we start? When I you know I go and talk to all sorts of parent home visiting programs and parent training programs and so on. What do we need? And it dawned on me that the first place I would start is videos of, of, of examples. Not heavily scripted, but of the parents who are in, uh, parents in any particular program can identify with. Just in the, you know, I sent you, I think that, maybe I sent you that copy of the tape. That's not a very good one. It just has some categories of things, a checklist that you might cover and in things you might do, but they don't. You don't need a talking head. What you need is is just for mothers to see people in cars talking with babies, people in the kitchen talking with babies as they're making stuff, people in the in the strollers uh, as they're. General orientation. That's right. But just how how people chit chat and commentary and move that. I you know I know I can do that because I've done it with so many. You know I ran did all sorts of research on infant and toddler daycare and had 
model programs that I was using. And so uh, lots of caregivers are really awkward with babies and, and toddlers, and you can teach them all to be chatty and interactive. You know, I mean, it's not, you know, it's not something that's kind of like just an ingrained personality trait. It's something that you learn, you can learn. Yeah, and, and it would seem to me that based on everything that we've been talking about this morning and, and the core of all of your work is, this is something we've got to learn. Yeah, and the thing is, is that if you focus, don't misdirect saying, I've got to teach you to be more positive and I've got to teach you how to use open-ended questions and, you know, saying, it's just confusing everybody to say, because all that stuff is automatically a part of extra talk. My, my formula for this would be, first and foremost, see, see the importance of, of being a steward of the health of your child's learning. Right. And that the key to that is the degree to which you're engaging them yes. in extending rich dialogue that, through work. Yes. Full stop. They so don't particularize that, but it's, the particulars aren't as important as those two generalizations. That's right. Yeah. And the reinforcer is really, I mean, and, and I've worked with parents who are, you know, with ed problems and so on, and it's easy to get dancing going. You know, sort of like if you just, you know, for example, just that comment, say some comment and pause, comment and pause, comment and pause. Don't quiz your kid, just comment and pause. Practice that. See what happened. And sure enough, the kid takes a turn. And it becomes a conversation if you're just commenting rather than demanding. It's really been a pleasure to talk with you. Your work is fantastic. Well, thank you. And I hope that what we do will contribute to more and more people understanding, appreciating, and, and finding your work. Yeah. Well, I, I hope so, too. But you, what you're doing is good. I mean, this is a great series. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there anything else that we haven't spoke to before we kind of shut down and move on? Nope. I think we covered it pretty nicely. Yep. All right. Let me, let me unhook you before you go any further.